tonight as we celebrate the birth of a king, and that king's name is Jesus. Happy birthday, Jesus. What a great time this is. See, for a lot of us, when it comes to Christmas, I think we love the public holidays, don't we? Love the public holidays, love the foods and the gifts. Who likes those? Food and the gifts. We love looking forward to seeing our families, some of us. All of us or some of us? <laughs> There's lots to love about Christmas. We love seeing the songs and the stories. Hey, Bubba. <laughs> he loves seeing me, clearly. That's fine. <laughs> There's a lot to love about Christmas, but I think for many of us, we love that Christmas time stays contained to Christmas. Now, I think for some of us, we go, fair enough if Christmas lingers through to New Year's, right? So if the Christmas tree stays up or the lights are still on the house or if the Christmas movies get a rerun, but really after New Year's, Christmas is done, right? We want it packed away, seal the deal, done as we start the new year. But the thing that I want to present to you tonight is actually that the meaning of Christmas isn't just for Christmas time. In fact, the meaning of Christmas is for every day of every year. But as we gather tonight, as we gather in this season, we remember an important truth that Jesus came to be our King, that what we celebrate at Christmas time was the gift of a new King. But you see, the problem is, I think for a lot of us, we treat Jesus a bit like our Christmas decorations. We bring him out at December, we give him a chance to light up and have his moment, and then he's packed up and he's back under the house and away out of our life. But I actually believe that we are called to keep Jesus front and center in every part of our life through the entire year. You see, if Jesus isn't, is only king at Christmas time, then he actually isn't the king of our lives at all. If Jesus is only the king during Christmas time, then he isn't the king of our lives at all. To pack Jesus up and to contain him to December only is to miss the point of what Christmas is really all about. Christmas is about a new king who has come to save us, redeem us, and lead us in every part of our life. But for a lot of us, we go, well, what difference does it make to have a newborn king? Yes, there was a newborn king and we celebrate and sing about him at Christmas time. But what difference does it really make to me? I mean, this year was interesting. We had a new king ascend the throne, King Charles. Big shift in society. Yet for many of us, it probably didn't make a huge difference to our everyday lives. And for some of us, we feel that way about Jesus. Yes, he was born. Yes, he was a new king. But how does it impact my everyday life? You see, for some of us, we're missing the true gift of Christmas because we leave Jesus at Christmas time. For some of us, we miss the true gift of Christmas because we're not quite sure what it means for this baby to become the king of our lives. For some of us, I think we miss the gift of Christmas because we just don't want Jesus to be our king, period. And for some of us, I think we miss the gift of Christmas because we become so familiar with this idea of Jesus being our king that maybe we've stopped paying attention to him. Maybe we've stopped noticing him. And if any of those statements describe you, my hope is that tonight we can go on a journey of rediscovering what actually is the good news of Christmas. What is it that we celebrate? And how is it that this baby could be a king that's relevant for us here today? In our lives. And so to do that, we're going to dive into Scripture together. And uh, we're going to look at a Christmas story and a Christmas character in particular that I think many of us, we don't like this character very much. But I want to look at this character because it's someone who responded to Jesus in a negative way. It's someone who didn't want Jesus to be the new king. And in many ways, I actually think this character can reflect the way that some of us respond to Jesus even here and now in our lives. And that character is the character of King Herod. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read to you four excerpts now out of Matthew chapter 2. It's too long for me to read the whole segment. So what I'm going to do is just focus in on four segments here that tell the story of King Herod. And then we're going to talk about how this could be relevant for us. So let's read this. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? 
We saw his star as it rose. We have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of the religious law and asked, Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem in Judea, they said. Now let's fast forward to verse 7. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. He told them, Go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me, so that I can go and worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went their way, and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. And it went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. We're now going to jump to verse 12. It says, When it was time to leave, this is the wise men, they returned to their own country by another route. For God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. After the wise men were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, flee to Egypt with the child and his mother, the angel said. Stay there until I tell you to return, because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. Last excerpt, verse 16, we see Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him. He sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under, based on the wise men's report of the star's first appearance. Let's stop there and look at this story for a minute. Wow, what's going on in this story, right? This is an unpleasant Christmas story. In fact, this is probably the part of the Christmas story that we would prefer to avoid, right? We're here to celebrate, we're here to talk about Jesus as the new king. And reading a story like this, it doesn't lift our spirits. But there was an interesting reaction here to Jesus that I think is worth looking at. It was a reaction to a newborn king. You see, the birth of Jesus, it triggers this political um, power struggle, right? This political power struggle. And Herod, we saw in Scripture, he was deeply disturbed, right? Not just a little bit disturbed. He was deeply disturbed by the news of this new baby. And so he commissions the wise men. He says, go and find this baby Jesus. Let me know where he is. I want to worship him too. But you and I know he was lying. He didn't want to worship Jesus. He wanted to eliminate Jesus. But of course, God warns these wise men. They return home by another route. Mary and Joseph, they escape to Egypt. And still Herod attempts to try and eliminate King Jesus. You've got to ask yourself, why is King Herod so afraid of this baby? Why would a grown man with all this power, all this wealth, all this status be concerned about the birth of a child? Well, it has everything to do with the phrase, King of the Jews. It's the phrase that the wise men used. They came searching for the king of the Jews. You see, at this time, King Herod actually had the title of the king of the Jews. He was technically the king of the Jews. The Romans had appointed him, so it wasn't through the Jewish legal process. But the thing was, he was an illegitimate king. Because in their time, in their society, to be a king, you had to be a descendant of David. And Herod was not a descendant of David. He was appointed by Rome, not by the Jewish authority. So he was an illegitimate king. And so when the wise men turn up saying, guess what? The new king of the Jews has been born. You know, the one that's related to King David, the, the legitimate king that we've been waiting for. You can understand why King Herod would be deeply disturbed. Because for him, if the true king comes onto the scene... He stands to lose everything, right? He loses his crown, which is a symbol of status and power and authority. He would lose his wealth and his assets, his way of life and his status. He'd probably even be afraid that this new king would try to eliminate him. And so Herod is deeply disturbed. So he tries to remove the threat. He tries to eliminate Jesus, but of course God saves him. God sends the angel, they escape to Egypt. And Herod lives out the rest of his days, not knowing whether he got Jesus or not. But I reckon in the back of his mind, he was afraid and he was concerned that that king was still out there. 
Now, this is an interesting story, perhaps not the story you were expecting to hear tonight, but I think it's interesting because it's the opposite reaction to the Christmas story to what a lot of us expect. You see, we talk about Christmas and we sing about Christmas. We hear the stories of Mary and Joseph and just imagine themselves beside themselves with this new baby. I mean, they know this was a miraculous conception, right? So this is a miracle that they get to celebrate. And there they are holding baby Jesus. They are over the moon. We see the shepherds. They're overjoyed. They go around telling everybody about what has just happened and what they've seen. There's the wise men who come, they're in reverent awe. They're giving these incredible gifts to this newborn king, recognizing him, honoring him. And then we see Herod, deeply disturbed, afraid of what he stands to lose. You see, Herod, he knew. He knew that there could only be one king. He knew there could only be one king, and he was unwilling to give that position to Jesus. You know, it baffles me because I think Herod had this incredible opportunity. I mean, imagine having the opportunity to host God in the flesh at your dinner table, right? Have you ever played that game before where you imagine who from history, dead or alive, would I invite to dinner one night? Have you ever played that game before? And you might sit there and go around the group and be like, oh, I'd love to have Elvis over for dinner. Or no, I'd get Mother Teresa over. Or no, I'd get Mozart over. Or whoever that person that you look up to, you imagine who you could have at your dining table. Well, here is King Herod with the opportunity to host the king of the world, God in the flesh. Except that's not what happened. I mean, I would give anything to jump in a time machine and go back to that moment. I mean, baby cuddles are already one of the greatest things ever, right? You hold a new little baby, they just snuggle up, they have this this warm smell about them. Can you imagine how much better it would be having baby cuddles with Jesus? Wouldn't that be the best? I would give anything to jump in a time machine and go back to that moment. But that's not the story that Herod wrote for his life, was it? He wrote a different story. You see, he could have gone down in history as the one who welcomes Jesus into this world. He could have been known as a friend of the Messiah. He could have defended Jesus from potential threats or enemies. I mean, who knows? He could have been Jesus' first follower. He could have written a very different story, but he didn't do that. Instead, he tried to hold on to a throne that he knew he wasn't entitled to. He knew he was illegitimate. And so he tried to remove Jesus because he knew that it could only be one king. And he was unwilling to give that position to Jesus. So for many of us, as we read this story, I don't think we're so different from Herod in a lot of ways. Now to preface this, we're not kings or queens. I mean, I don't know. Are there any kings or queens in the room tonight? Anyone own a castle that I'm not aware of? I don't think so. (laughs) And I don't think I sit in a room full of people that are capable of the atrocities that King Herod did. So that's not what I'm meaning when I say this. But I think for a lot of us, in some way, shape, or form, we try to hold on to the thrones of our own lives. You see, each of us have a throne. We have a throne, something like this, a throne that represents the boss's chair. Who sits in the boss's chair in our life? And I think for many of us, like King Herod, we are unwilling to hand over the seat of highest authority, the, sh- the seat of kingship in our life to this baby who is called Jesus, who we celebrate at Christmas time. Many of us can be resistant or unwilling to invite him into that place. You see, I think we like the good things that Jesus has to give us, right? We celebrate those good things. I mean, we want forgiveness for our sins. That sounds great. We want access to God. We want peace and joy. That sounds amazing. Give me peace and joy. We want eternal life. And tell you what, we want public holidays and Christmas food. We want all of those things that come with celebrating the arrival of this newborn king. But the idea of giving up the throne, I think for many of us, we're not quite sure about that. We're a little bit hesitant. We're a little bit apprehensive around what that is could mean. I mean, we don't want anyone interfering with our careers and our plans, our achievements. 
We don't want anyone getting in the way of our lifestyle or our ambitions. Or perhaps we've got hobbies or vices or habits that we turn to that we think Jesus may not approve of. And so we're afraid to put him in that chair. We're afraid to invite him into that space for what it could look like or what it could mean for us. Some of us carry a fear that he'll take our fun away. That maybe if Jesus was in the king's seat in our life, that he would restrict us. Maybe we'd miss out on things that are good. Or maybe he just wouldn't have our best interests at heart. Maybe we fear that he would sit on that throne and just use us for his own purposes, not considering the greater good for us. It's why for many of us, I think we're hesitant about the idea of Jesus sitting on that throne all the time in our life. And so you know what we do? What I think we do is we actually give Jesus some visiting privileges, don't we? We say to Jesus, it's December. So in December, you know what? That's your month, Jesus. You can sit on the throne and you can have all the Christmas lights and all the focus and that's fine because it's December. Or we say, Jesus, you know what? You can have Sundays, that's okay. And you can have 15 minutes every morning during the week. I will give you that throne for 15 minutes every morning and then you're out and I'm back on. We do a bit of that, don't we? Or we say, Jesus, you know what? I just don't think this is the right job for you. I don't think you're going to enjoy all the things that come with this. Come with me, Jesus. I'm going to give you a different throne over here that you can look after because that's not the job for you. Or others, we see Jesus coming and we say, "Uh uh-uh, this is not the place in my life where you fit. Some of us, we just give Jesus visiting privileges. We say, actually, you know what? I don't want you to sit on that throne every single day of every single year in our life. You see, the problem is, I think we have a misunderstanding about what it means to have a throne in our life. I think we misunderstand what it means to have a king or someone who is the highest point of authority in our life. You see, we are unwilling to give that position to Jesus at times, I believe, because we think that the alternate, the opposite of Jesus sitting here is that we get to sit there, right? We often think that if Jesus isn't there, that I'm the one sitting on the throne of my life. But the interesting thing is, that's not what Scripture teaches us. Scripture doesn't teach us that the opposite of Jesus sitting on the throne of our life is us. No, no. The Bible actually teaches us that the opposite of Jesus being on the throne of our lives is that sin exists on the throne of our lives. Let me show this to you in Romans chapter 7. This is what the Apostle Paul says as he demonstrates this for us. He says, And I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I am not really the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. Here we see this example where the Apostle Paul, this godly man that we we put up on a pedestal in Scripture, he's wrestling with this issue in his life where he is recognizing that at times there is someone or something different sitting on this throne that isn't Jesus and it isn't Paul. He's recognizing his sinful nature that seems to control what he does, that seems to find its way out in his life and his decisions without him wanting it to. He says, I want to do good, but for some reason I keep doing these other things. The alternate to Jesus sitting on the throne of our life isn't that you and I get to sit there. It's actually that sin is sitting in the place where Jesus should be. You see, I don't just think King Herod tried to eliminate Jesus from an earthly perspective. I actually believe that there was sin in his life. There was pride. There was a lust for power that was driving that decision. And for you and I, I think we all experience this in some way, shape, or form. I mean, have you ever said something and immediately been like, oh, I wish you didn't say that. <laughs> have you ever done that before? Have you ever made a decision, done something, and later on just regretted it and gone, you know what? If I had have thought that through, I would have done something very different. Have you ever acted on an impulse and reaped the consequence of that action and gone, you know what? That wasn't even like me to do that. I think we all, in some way, shape, or form, know what that feels like. To have those moments where we go, actually, something else was on the throne of my life, and I'm torn. I want to be someone different. 
I want to live a different life. I want to make better decisions. I want to become someone new. But I keep coming back and things keep coming out of me that I don't want. You see, I've had this wrestle in my life so many times, this tear of who is sitting on the throne of my life. And at times it comes out in all kinds of ugly and strange ways. I remember this time, I'll tell you two stories, one from when I was a kid and uh, one from when I was an adult. As a kid, I remember being on holidays. Uh, we had a, a holiday house at the Royal National Park in Sydney. And we'd go down there every year for school holidays. And I remember this moment where I got really, really frustrated with my sister. Like, really frustrated, you know, like the kettle's boiling kind of thing, and it boils really, really quickly. And I just remember in that moment, I picked up an object, and I can't remember what it was, whether it was a ball or a toy or a pencil case or something. I picked it up, and I threw it straight at her head. And bang! Got her straight in the head. I didn't even think about it. It was just kettle boiled, angry, bang! And I remember she cried, and rightly so, right? That would have hurt. And I copped it, right? Mum and dad, I, I copped it from mum and dad. Thank you, mum, for raising me well. <laughs> I missed out on beach privileges that day. I remember sitting there miserable at the consequences of my action. But I reacted out of an impulse, out of a broken part of me that really doesn't reflect who I wanted to be. As as a kid, as an adult, I still wrestle with some of these tendencies. And for me, some of this has come out in my worst moments when I'm parenting, when I'm tired and I'm feeling like I'm at the end of my rope. That's when I have that dilemma as to who sits on the throne in my life. And I remember there was a season in my life when I was just so sleep deprived, so delirious that I found myself, this is when Leora was, was young. She would have only been 12, 18 months old, getting so angry with this child because she wouldn't sleep. And I remember being up, it was like one or two in the morning and she wouldn't sleep. I remember yelling, being like, go to sleep. I was so angry. And it just rose so quickly in me. And quickly I was disgusted by the person I could see in myself. I wanted to love her. I wanted to be kind to her. I wanted her to see the kind of dad that has Jesus sitting on the throne with the Holy Spirit, the fruits of the gifts coming out through me. But that wasn't what was happening in that moment. In my brokenness, something different was sitting on the throne of my life, in my tiredness, in my struggle, in my anger. And at that time, um, I did a bit of journaling and diary entries around how I was feeling. And I just want to show you an excerpt out of that. And um, this is what I wrote, right? I wrote, who am I that I don't recognize? All this time, hiding just inside, face to face, is this who I am? Just the man in the midnight mirror. All right now, I've had a background. I've song wrote and done all that kind of stuff. So here I am just kind of pouring out my heart in a bit of a personal psalm. And this has become a little bit of a, a phrase that I've come back to. Am I just the man in the midnight mirror? Am I just going to be that person who in my tiredness and my brokenness, I look in the mirror and I don't recognize because something different is coming out of me to the person who I want to be? You see, that was what the Apostle Paul was struggling with in that passage. And it brings us back to our theme today around who is on the throne in your life. Because for me, I want to be someone different. But to be that different person, I actually need to dethrone sin from the throne and room of my life. And I actually need to invite Jesus to be on that throne. Because it's only when He sits in that place as my Lord and my Savior and my King that something starts to shift and break in me. That I start to become a new person that is capable of being something different to what that broken part was in my life. But I tell you what, it's the constant battle, right? It's a constant battle to keep saying, Jesus, I want you to sit on the throne of my life. So I wonder, how about you? Who is sitting on the throne of your life? What is sitting on the throne of your life? And is it what you want to be on that throne? Have you invited Jesus to be your king? That Jesus that we celebrate at Christmas time, that came to this earth as a baby, but didn't just stay as a baby, who grew up and went to the cross, who died and rose again for you. Is that the person who sits on the throne of your life? Or is sin still doing its thing? Does it have the highest place in your life? 
And is it wreaking havoc? You see, the good news about Christmas, the reason why we celebrate that a king was born, because when Jesus came, suddenly there was an alternative. Suddenly we have the option for a new king to sit in the throne of our lives. And this king is good. This king is kind. This king is wise. This king has the capacity to bring transformation and change into our life. That's the kind of king that I want on the throne of my life. And that's what we remember. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. We don't just take our hats off as a token tribute to this baby Jesus. We remind ourselves every year that He's the King and the throne of our heart. You see, for you, maybe 2023 doesn't have to be a year that's marked by decisions that you regret. It doesn't have to be a year of broken relationships, of addictions or destructive habits. It doesn't have to be a year that's marked by those things. It could be a different kind of year. A year where you actually say, you know what, Jesus, I want you to be on that throne. I want to live as a new person. I want to invite you to change me and transform me. I want to walk in a renewed sense of what is possible in my life. I want you to be the king. And all of that is possible for you because there was a new king in town. There was a new king in town at Christmas, baby Jesus, who we celebrate here today. You see, there is only one king in our lives. There can only be one position, one king. Who is it going to be? Will you invite Jesus into that place? Will you give him more than just visiting privileges? Will you give him unlimited access 24-7, 365 days per year? Will you say, Jesus, I want you to be my king? And so what I want to do is I just want to take a moment to pray. And for some of you here today, you might go, you know what? I want to start that journey again. Maybe I've invited Jesus to be the king before, but I've drifted. I've forgotten. I've gotten busy. My focus has been elsewhere. Maybe today as we celebrate Christmas, it's the day for you to say, you know what, Jesus, I want you back on that seat in my life. For some of you, you have never invited him into this place. And maybe tonight you're saying, I want to get Jesus on the throne of my life for the first time in my life. So why don't we, you join me as we pray and we give Jesus back that throne that only he deserves. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we come to Christmas time to remember who you are and what you have done, we want to put you in the rightful place in our life. We want to put you on the throne of our hearts. Jesus, we say that we are sorry for the times that we have drifted, that we have lost our focus. Lord Jesus, that we've tried to claim the throne for ourselves, or Lord, that we've just pushed you away. And so tonight for all of us here, We invite you afresh into our hearts, into our lives. And we say, would you be our king? Would you be the one that sits there? And so, Jesus, we pray that as you take that space in our life, that you would transform us, that you would shape us, that your Holy Spirit would fill us and make us new. And so we praise you and we worship you in your mighty name. Amen.